Hi, everyone. Welcome to Care in the Load. It's Mark and Annette uh, with you today. And uh, as we mentioned in our last in our last uh, uh, episode, we are changing the way that we identify who, <laughs> who we are uh, with our podcast to Trail Angels powered by Care in the Load. We are so happy to to have Aaron with us as one of our first Trail Angels. Specifically, we know we've had many guests, but now we are going to refer Aaron to you as a trail angel because that's exactly what you are. That's what you've been doing for so long in your life, and we just added another another name for you. But thank Aww. you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Good. Well, we really appreciate you, and uh, you know, to understand who Aaron McCullough is, let me let me just read a little bit about uh, her. Uh, and, and I think you'll get to know her really quickly. Uh, she's got a great spirit uh, that she brings with her. And, and uh, so let's, let's just read that. Erin uh, McCullough is a thought leader, an in-demand speaker, and an international teacher that helps people create impenetrable joy. And we're going to get to that in a second here because that's a very important term, impenetrable joy, so that they can be calm, have peace of mind, and meaning in their life now. Now we need that. <laughs> that is, that's a word here as well today. Erin had an anxiety disorder that uh, had her hold up in her home for over a year. Through that experience, she learned how and why that happened and developed strategies to overcoming and preventing it, which is what she teaches. Erin vowed that when she found solutions to overcoming and preventing anxiety, she would do whatever she could to make sure that no one had that experience so that so that's been your vision, hasn't it? Yeah. Erin uh, spent a decade studying the mind-body connection, visualization, and ways to steal the mind. Over the decade, she has created simple strategies to overcoming and preventing anxiety, stress, worthy, worry, not worthy, but worry and, and overwhelm, all terms that we are all very familiar with during the last number of months, so that all of her clients live a life of intentional joy. She has been an entrepreneur for 21 years and consulting businesses and business leaders for 16 years. If you have questioned who you are and what you are meant to be doing in this life, let Erin help you discover your own path to joy. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today, Erin, is uh, we're going to be asking you what it means to experience joy. Now, be be before we get into this, I just have to tell you that very often when we uh, begin to do our research on a particular guest, you know, I'll, I'll look at particular words. Now, you talked about anxiety, stress, worry, and overwhelm. Those are all important words that uh, we've heard a lot of, but there was one, actually two words that really interested me, and I kept on going back to those two words. It was impenetrable joy. Yeah. And, so, and so I went, I, I went in to do a Google search. Now, typically when you do a Google search on something, you'll find all kinds of references. Guess what the number one reference was with impenetrable joy? It was Erin McCullough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, and it, had like, you, <laughs> it had you a reference from something else. And, and so the, the interesting thing about that is you, you've heard people say that uh, she wrote the book on this or that. Well, I guess we can say <laughs> that you wrote the book on impenetrable joy. What does that mean? Well, so my definition of impenetrable joy is this idea that you no longer have to be at the mercy of people or circumstances to decide how you're feeling, good, bad, how your life is, how your day is. And it encompasses, you know, the exuberance of the word joy, of course, the excitement and all of that. But it also includes things like calm, peace of mind, and meaning and purpose. And so it encompasses all of those things. But the kind of the key part is how you create an internal experience of joy so that you don't have to be at the mercy or beholden to what's happening outside of you. You get to just decide how you feel inside and navigate the external world in a different way. That makes sense. Yeah, it, it really does. And and maybe the question that I'd ask you is if I if I use the following sentence, how would you address it? 
And that makes me so mad sometimes. <laughs> is that possible or is that a lie? Oh, I'm the fact sorry, that but... someone can make us mad or, or make oh, us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a lie. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it's, uh, you know. Most people, I think their experience is that, you know, that person made me feel this way or that circumstance made me feel this way. And then we like to tell all the stories about it, right? We tell all our friends and victim. our family and yeah, right. That's exactly it. It's victim stance. I talk about how do you take responsibility for all of your emotions because they are yours. And even though other people are involved there, they, it really always comes back to you. I always say return to sender. It's always like, <laughs> yes, that situation happened. And now I get to go inside and decide what I've decided about it because um, that's the important piece. It's not what, you know, this person or that circumstance was doing. It's like, you know, cause that's where the control is. That's the only place that we have control. Everything else, we are trying to control people and things to make us feel better, whereas we can just make ourselves feel better. And then whatever's happening outside, we can just be at ease with. So it takes returning to the center and, to, and owning those feelings to actually create that, that joy then. Yeah. I mean, I teach a process where it's like you understand that every time... so. If you could understand this world in the sense that it was supporting what I believe we're here to do, which is to grow, uh, you can either call it spiritually, consciously, um, evolve as a person, self-develop, you know, when we understand that that's why we're here is to have those things versus what like society and would like us to think is why we're here, which is to amass things and money, and then we feel good about ourselves that actually is not a winning game. There's no winning to that piece. So it's like, if, you know, the idea is that we want to feel good most of the time, then we have to go inside and do that inner work. And that inner work is this growth piece. And we can't do the growth without recognizing what's going on. And so when we start or we stop, saying that person or that thing made me feel this way and we go, I feel this way because of that thing, then we can look inside and go, I wonder what happened there that this is my reaction to that. Because, you know, you can bring in other people and they wouldn't have the same reaction. So that's how you know it's yours, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you have these experiences, we always go, well, oh, well, that that happened and now I feel this way. It's like, no, I just feel this way. I mean, this did happen, but I just feel this way. How come I feel this way? And then we do that internal work where you go, oh, I feel this way because maybe I had some hurts in the past that this is sort of poking at. And when we understand that and that actually all these experiences are for our benefit so that we can grow, that really shifts like the whole deal on its head. And you're just like, oh, this is a different life. It's not be in reaction to everybody and everything. It's like, oh, where can I grow as a human? And through that growth experience, this impenetrable joy. It's interesting that you, you talk about this because it's so opposite what yeah. the world is teaching us. And yet what we really want, and I, I believe the world wants this joy, they're just looking at it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. and, and so to have that to create that um, impenetrable, ugh, I can't even talk, impenetrable, impenetrable joy. joy, we have to look inside. Why is it so hard for us to look inside and really be honest with ourselves and what's going on inside? Because sometimes I think we have this even distorted thoughts that we want to look, we don't want to look inside. But why do you think that's that's the case. Well, I think it inhibits us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. The short answer is that we spend all of our time not experiencing our emotions. Now, I know people are thinking, but I'm in reaction to all these things. You're in reaction, but that's not experiencing. That's being in reaction to. I'm talking about like recognizing, like having emotional awareness and going, oh, I'm having an emotion right now. 
you know, versus like flipping out and raising your voice and doing all the things that we do. And the reason that is, is because at a young age, we're sort of trained not to feel our emotions, right? Little kid falls down, scrapes his knee, and we don't, we don't just let them, you know, cry. And we're like, oh, it's okay, honey, don't cry, right? So as innocent as that is, we learned not to have emotions. And the reason as adults, we don't want our kids to cry is because we don't want to feel bad, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, we sort of are perpetuating this thing. Again, no fault, no shame, no, no blame, no, none of that. It's just, this is where it's starting. And so when we allow ourselves to have emotions and be emotional people, because we are human beings, not doings, we're told that we're supposed to be doings, but like when we just be who we need to be, experience the emotions that we need to experience when we're experiencing them, then we're not tamping down all these things. And there's so many obvious things like, you know, us trying to dodge our emotions, right? Alcohol and drugs. So e that's easy, right? Sex, uh, um, gambling, uh, shopping, um, all these things. There's so many less obvious, subtle things too. Like, um, how about this, uh, like badge of honor of being busy all the time? You know, mm. you know, I'm so busy. I can't get anything. can't get everything done. I'm so, so busy. That's also another way to not feel, right? Is let me go from thing to thing to thing to thing so that I can't be in this moment now. Where we really want to be is in the present moment. That's where all the good stuff is. But we're doing all these things because we've sort of been taught to not feel the things. So we use, you know, TV and helicopter parenting. How about just, you know, making your kid more important than you, not having a life because of it and running them from thing to thing to thing. Um, there's just, I mean, I think you can look at like every aspect of your life and see, oh my gosh, I am, you know, food, another one, or, you know, being in this club or that club or, you know, just media in general, social media, my gosh, you know, just so many distractions that we have versus just like, you know, where do people schedule in time to be still and like look outside at the nature or take a walk and go hiking on a regular basis? That's not even scheduled in. And those are beautiful moments that we have. We know they make us feel good and we don't schedule them in like we schedule in everything else, you know? That, that is so insightful. Uh, you know, what, what really got me with what you just said is, is that uh, we all have different uh, techniques and different devices that we use uh, to, to maybe rationalize uh, our happiness. You know, and, and what you said kind of resonated with me, and that is, is that uh, I'm too busy to do anything. I'm too busy to, to, uh, to be happy. I'm too busy to enjoy this moment. And, and, I, and I think that's almost a little bit of a punishment for me. Uh, I, I punish myself by saying, I know I need to be more productive. And I take myself out of the moment. Mm. Do you see that happen with people? Definitely. I mean, I think we're everywhere, but right here, you know, we're a lot of times we're, you know, taking from the past and projecting it into the future. You know, if I do this, then I'll have this outcome. And I, I think if we took the time to look at, you know, those, that formula, we would see how faulty it really is because this life is nuanced. It's not like that. I mean, they're clearly like our brain want like it does these things because, it wants to organize information. It's taking in all this information. How can I file this away so I could use it in the, in the future? And things like, you know, don't stick your hand on the stove when it's hot. Obviously, that's a good one. <laughs> but some of these other ones where we made these decisions at younger ages and then keep this formula of if I do this, then this is the outcome. And then don't look at the outcome and recognize that that formula is not working out that's kind of the piece. Like we do just a lot of things kind of on autopilot. You know what I mean? I, I completely understand that for years. I, I was numb. I was numb because I didn't want to feel pain over here. And so I, I just did the things to be busy, did the things to keep my mind focused. Cause I knew if I did all these things, I wouldn't feel the pain, but then I didn't feel the joy. Mm -hmm. And, and I just kind of became this, this person, I had a smile on my face, but inside I didn't feel that joy. 
And it took me slowing down, which actually was me getting sick, that mm -hmm. it took a toll physically on my body that I was forced to slow down. And then I started to feel, I started to allow myself to feel emotions, to become an emotional person. And naturally I still go to the, I don't want to feel the emotions, but I have to intentionally say, no, feeling those things are good. Even the pain is good because the pain is what helps me to move forward or to move through something to help me actually become this person with joy. Yeah, it's my belief that disease and the breakdown of the body comes from this tamping down of the emotions. We do hold emotions in our body on a cellular level. And when we can't let that out or it's just stacking up in our body is kind of how I see it, then it's really hard for it to, to rid itself of it. And, you know, I don't know what you believe, but for me, mind, body, and spirit are three equal parts. And so often we can, you know, we can delude the mind, we can delude the spirit, but the body is like, ooh, that hurts, or that's not quite right, and that's sort of scary, going to have to attend to that. And I feel like maybe the body is kind of the last-ditch effort of your whole being saying, hey, wait a minute, we need to wake up here because something is not right. We've, you know, let these emotions get the best of us and now it's showing up in our body to get our attention because we've, you know, like you said, you know, just let life sort of be on autopilot or asleep. And then um, all of a sudden you have to wake up when you have something going on with your body. And so that's my belief on that. And we have, you know, obviously there are some you know, we've all sort of glommed on to this, there is a mind-body connection in terms of, you know, high stress, you can get a heart attack, things like that. It's, it's, it's even more deeper. It's deeper than that. It is. And I, I agree with you. And it wasn't until I started focusing on mind, body, and the spirit mm -hmm. that the healing really began. I could, you know, focus on one thing at a time for a while. I was trying to do that, but never all together. But when I intentionally was focusing on this whole piece, me, this, you know, the, all of me, that's when the healing came. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's beautiful, but it, there's a key yeah. point to that. You can't just focus on one or the other. It was just like you said, Aaron, all of it. Yeah, I mean, you, there's something wrong with your body and you, you feel like, oh, I need to go to the doctor and I got to do all these things. And, um, you know, and sometimes these protocols and things work or I don't know, whatever kind of medicine you believe in or like to go to. However, that's how people continue to get sick as they don't do the whole piece, right? The holistic approach. It's just, oh, my body's breaking down. Let me take this drug or do this protocol but then you can just create it again. Like that's how powerful we are. We can create these things. It's amazing. But why not create what you we gotta get want to get to that root cause? Yeah. We, right. we, had a, we had a neat experience, a really neat experience a couple of years ago. We were walking on the beach in San Diego on, on Mission Beach. And uh, as we were walking along, we, we, we found a, uh, a man that was putting these Karens, these trail markers that uh, we, we talk about, uh, on top of each other. And some of them seemed to absolutely defy uh, any type of physical laws. You know, there, there'd be a small rock holding a 50 pound boulder on top of it there. And he taught us a lesson that we thought was really important that uh, we have not forgotten. He said, you know, what you have to find is the three points of contact so that you can stack one rock on top of each other. And, and we, we looked, we, we tried doing it on two points of contact. It doesn't work. You can get it to, to balance for a minute. But as soon as anything touches it, any wind or any, any obstacle does anything, it will tip over. So, so ironically, we came home and, and we developed uh, this idea that to the three points of contact are, guess what? Body, mind, and spirit. And, I and, and, I, and, and I think that anything that we do incorporates 
anything that we do well incorporates, incorporates. those three areas. And it was yeah. interesting because the winds are going to blow in life. The mm -hmm. rain's going to come and all those things. And, and he, he taught us, he goes, there could be 50 mile an hour winds and this will not blow over. But he could barely touch it when I only had these two points of contact and it just fell right over. And so, you know, like Mark said, it's, it's this, it was a visual for us that taught us this important lesson of who we are and what we need to do to be able to be whole, to be able to, to not blow over when the, the winds and the storms come because they will. And yeah, so I mean, that's the only guarantee, right? Is that everything's changing all the time. <laughs> exactly. So I, you know, I love just all that we're talking about, but I want to talk about what does it take to make a change in, in, in our lives? You know, so we, we've kind of gone through life. We grow up like we've, you know, talked about, about, you know, don't, don't cry. Oh, don't do this. You know, let's just, the, the same old, you know, stereotype of everything that we all probably were brought up on. And how do we go from that mindset of, you know, let's hurry and get better. Let's not feel to allowing ourselves to go through the steps to change our life. And what are the steps of changing? Well, I think the steps to changing, I mean, and listen, I know that it's scary, like, because we don't, you know, we think we're controlling things and we're not, <laughs> but we're still in that <laughs> illusion sometimes. And so it's, it's just the idea of like, nobody's raising their hands going, woohoo, let's get some change in here. You know, nobody's doing that. I know change it. is hard. Change is scary. You're, you're right. It's scary. But the thing is, is I think the one of the biggest pieces is that it is possible to create a life that you love. And I, and I'm just not sure many people recognize that. And so if nothing else comes of this podcast, if somebody or your whole audience goes, Oh, I could look for something different. Fantastic. <laughs> um, but in terms of change, so change looks like to me, in my estimation, it looks like awareness, right? So oftentimes that comes with, um, you know, crisis. It's like, uh, you know, can be a body crisis, can be, you know, a breakdown, whatever it looks like. Um, doesn't have to, but the most meaningful <laughs> when it's that way, because we're, we've, I've had enough, you know, you're at, I have had enough. I need to have a different something. Uh, I'm open to hearing something new, you know, um, and that's what it takes sometimes. So that's one is you have some sort of like moment where you're like, okay, I've had enough. The second piece is emotional awareness, like starting to understand, oh, I'm having emotions. These are what they are. This is what they're mm -hmm. called. And this is what they mean to me, right? And then sort of going in, right? So you have these emotional experiences. And I'll tell you, we go to the same ones. Most people have their go-to, you know, for some people it's anger, you know, things aren't going their way. Boom. All of a sudden their voice is raised. They're short, you know, all the things. Right. And so we all kind of have our go-to things that we love to do. Um, or no, maybe not love to do, but they just come up because that's how we do them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, habit. Right. And then um, we go into our body and we go, where does that located in our body? Like, where am I feeling that? The three places most, most emotions are kind of held are like your gut, right? Um, your heart, which makes sense, mm -hmm. and your throat area. And so those three, and you're kind of looking and, you know, like, how do I feel? Where is that like sitting? Am I feeling hot or, you know, uh, clenched or, you know, all these things. And the purpose behind that is because, again, they live in the body. And when we address our body in that way, then we're in this moment. Oftentimes we say, oh, I have anxiety or I have overwhelm. Those are up here in the body is present moment. So we want to get out of here, get into here, into the body so that we can feel that we're here in this moment now. And then the next step for me, I think, is coming up with some strategies. So we've been practicing this other way of being for so long that we need a tool or a strategy to do something different because 
we all know can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome, right? So we have to have some strategies that we can go to ourselves and go, oh, okay, in the past I would do this, now I'm going to try this other thing. And then the very last piece, which I think is the hardest of all of them, is this practice piece, right? Practice the new way of being. And that new way is going to feel not good. It's not going to feel right, certainly out of the gate. But I will tell you, on the other side of this process is freedom. And by freedom, I mean the no longer being beholden to people and circumstances as to whether you feel good or not anymore. You just feel good. And then all these things are happening outside of yourself. And so you create some space between them. So you can respond versus react and it can be intentional and you can catch yourself and you can see the patterns in your life and you can do them differently little by little baby steps on the way to this wonderful experience of no longer having to have, you know, have a good or bad day. It's just having a day, a day with lovely moments in it all throughout the day which is a very different experience than the one that I had up until about four years ago. So you talk about, I mean, I, I love these points here and creating this life that we love and you've obviously practiced. <laughs> yes, a lot, <laughs> like a lot, a lot. <laughs> You froze. No, no. Here we are. You're back. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. No, oh, I don't know either. That usually if it, the glitches, it comes right back, but let me, I'll just pick up. Okay. Um, I didn't hear the question. So. Yeah. You just got through talking about the four points mm -hmm. of awareness and mm -hmm. the strategy to use these points to help to create this life that we live. Oh, there we are again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? Uh, this is weird. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so let's go right into the question. I am going to go right into the question. I've just got to rethink my question now because mm -hmm. I've got off track too. Okay. You say that the last four years is just when you've created this, this life that you love. It took yeah. a lot of, it took a lot of practice obviously because the other things I mean, just to recognize your emotions and to be able to name them, I would think would have been very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I was, oh gosh. I mean, you, you were saying before that you were asleep. I was definitely asleep in my life. I mean, I really thought that I was living the life because I had all the things. I had a successful business. I was making good money. I had, you know, uh, time flexibility. I had gorgeous daughter that I just got all this time I could spend doing all the things. And I was literally like killing myself on a whole host of different ways, you know, just so stressed out, so anxiety ridden, so all over the place, you know, frantic and, um, and it was just so unnecessary. And I didn't know that there was a different way. I just really thought that like this life was about like challenge after challenge. And I also thought it was those things that we talked about in terms of society. Like if I collect all the things, you know, the houses and the cars and the, you know, then I would feel good, but I felt miserable. Like I really didn't feel good. And then I started doing, you know, triathlons and things. And let me see if I can, you know, crush my goals and, you know, uh, longer and shorter time distances and, you know, all the things. And I just found myself exhausted, you know, and um, the things that should have made me happier when I was doing the things that, you know, people would say would make you happy. They just didn't feel good. And I would, you know, literally be coaching a soccer game 
and be so distracted by my business and making sure everything was taken care of that I couldn't be anywhere. I couldn't be where I was at ever. And so I loved to travel, which is another, you know, talk about another distraction, travel. I love to travel, but I realize now that part of the reason I love traveling so much is because when you're traveling, you're in the present moment because you don't know where you're at. And if there's a language issue or you don't know where to go to get whatever the things you need or want, then you have to be there then and doing all those things and really be like involved. And I think that's why people love travel so much is because, oh, I can get out of my environment and be in the moment. But I don't think they realize that's why they like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, we, we had a world traveler that uh, we interviewed a couple of weeks ago. And uh, one of the questions we asked her towards the end was, if you could go anywhere you want to in the world, where would you go? And her answer surprised both of us. She said, I'd go somewhere where I've never been before. Probably for the same reason there as well, is because that uh, creates opportunity. And so, you know, as, as, as I'm, I'm listening to you here, I, we hear a lot of people who tell us, you mean I can feel differently? Mm. And, and it's, it's a surprise to so many people to recognize that they don't have to feel the way that they have been feeling, but it's, but it's been conditioned. It's been conditioned. And just like you said, you went from this life that you thought if you acquired all these things, you did all these things, that that's when you'd be happy. That's when you'd have joy. But then you you also talked about how when you follow these four steps to create this life that you now love, being aware, the awareness, the emotional awareness, coming up with the strategies, and then practicing, you found freedom. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, you know... Again, we, we do these other things for so long. It just feels so awkward to do something else. And I can't even really express how I knew that if I just kept doing it, I would have a different experience. I think it was probably, there's a couple of books that have been super um, influential to, to this shift. Um, and I think, so one of the things that I really recognize from one of the books, um, and the book is called uh, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Mm -hmm. One of the things I recognize is that, um, and that he teaches, is that you are not your thoughts and you are not your emotions. And nobody had ever said that before. And I thought, wait, what do you mean? Like, I didn't really get it because I did think, you know, that was why I was on this roller coaster ride of my life was because I thought that I was my thoughts and my emotions, or more likely, I really thought I was my emotions. So I was in reaction to everybody and everything. And when I heard that piece and I sat with it, I realized that he was correct because what he says is that the reason you know you're not your thoughts or your emotions is because you can have a thought or you can have an emotion and name that. So who is that that's naming those things? And I went, whoa, wait a minute here. Like there's something else here. And so in getting deeper with the information that he was teaching, I realized, yeah, I am the spectator of those things or I can be. And so when I began to step back and create space between my thoughts and my emotions, I started to recognize that I could actually respond versus react to some things. And when I chose to do a different way, something that I had normally done very much the same way, I started to feel differently and people started to react differently to me. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute here. There might be something to this. And I started to enact some of that in my business. I would just do things like, I would tell my employees and my, and my clients, we were going to reframe the business and we were no longer going to work with people who didn't appreciate us and what it is the service we were providing. And do you know what happened? it weeded out all the people that were constantly complaining mm -hmm. and it brought in all these people that really appreciated my staff and myself 
and the things that we did. And then it attracted even more people that appreciated who we were and what we were doing. And boy, what a difference that made, you know, a lot less complaints. And so I started to do these little things and just sort of test them out and try to stay steadfast. It's really hard when you're a business owner and you've got like, you know, you've got this mentality, like more is better, or, you know, I got to keep everybody afloat. I've got all these employees I've got to take care of and responsible for. But when you make the shift and you just decide that you're going to test something out that feels good to you, it often just works, you know? And so it, I, we, there was no level off of business. It was just some people just no longer wanted to hang out with us because we were enjoying ourselves all of a sudden. And, you know, being very clear in our communication that this is the kind of service we provide and it's not for everybody, you know? And I think that can get you in trouble when you're in business sometimes is we like to think we can, you know, be the service or the product for everybody. And we're really just for the people who resonate with us. That, yeah, that, that, that is so insightful there. Uh, you, you talk about uh, responding versus reacting. And I'm thinking of all the applications that that has, <laughs> whether it's uh, in business, whether it's in family life, dealing with our mm -hmm. children, however we deal with it. There, there's so much wisdom in that whole idea of responding versus reacting. And it's with that in mind, let's talk about attitude. Yeah. Uh, you know, a attitude can take so many different directions, probably because we react maybe sometimes more than we respond there. But how important is attitude in our lives? I think it's really important. But I want to be clear that, you know, like our society, we really like this let's everybody think positive all the time deal. And I'm 100% in for positivity, but not at the expense of real healing and growth. Um, I think oftentimes people will say things like, you know, they might complain about something and they'll say, but I'm, you know, I'm so blessed, you know, and it's like, I don't want to, I shouldn't complain because I'm so blessed. And it's like, um, I hear the words you're saying, but I'm not feeling it. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, it's okay to not feel good about certain things, you know, acknowledge and then move on. You know, um, I think we use, an, I mean, positivity is just another one of those band-aids. Like, I don't get to feel my emotions because, you know, I know there's other people that ha are worse off than me. Wonderful. There are other people that are worse off and, and I have compassion for them as well. And how about a little compassion for yourself? Like this doesn't feel good right now. I've got to go in and sort of navigate what's going on for me right now. So I'm going to just do that right now, even though it may be inappropriate at this particular moment, or I'm going to step out and just take the moment I need to acknowledge myself and go, yeah, I'm hurting right now. It's okay to hurt. And then I'm going to find something to pull me out of that. And that is part of that is um, attitude. I don't mean attitude in terms of that band-aid of the positivity thing, but mm -hmm. more of we have to choose preferences, you know, and if I'm going to choose a preference for an experience, I'm going to choose joy or, you know, something that's positive over a negative preference. So that's part of that emotional awareness thing. Like, am I constantly choosing, you know, like I think a lot of people's most, mostly their experiences, like this thing happened and it wasn't what I wanted let me pile on all the other things that aren't working out in my life to that one thing versus, okay, this one thing happened. It didn't feel good. And I'm going to shift and decide I'm going to concentrate on all the millions of things that are working out. Because the thing is, there are so many things working out in our lives, like so, so many. We're like literally concentrating on like the handful of things that aren't exactly what we wanted. When we could be concentrating on, you know, look, look, I got up this morning, another day, I have another like day, hopefully, that I can, you know, be in this world. And I got to sleep on this amazing mattress. I've got a roof over my head. I've got pillows. I've got, you know, running water. I've got, you know, all like millions, literally. And we're concentrating on, you know, traffic and uh, running with somebody and uh, whatever, you know, and it's like, or an argument or what, whatever those things are. And so just in that shift, you know, when we start to focus on the things that are going well, 
that sort of raises kind of like, you know, our attitude and people feel that like we, there's so much nonverbal going on all the time, even over zoom and all the things. And so we can just take a moment that didn't feel good. What are like, let me list off five things that are going fantastic in my life. I've got people who love me. I've got a roof over my head. I've got some food security. Um, I have a vehicle if I need to go somewhere, you know, all the things. There's just so many. And we're just like kind of focused on the wrong thing. So that attitude shift, when we recognize that, can make a huge difference because people are attracted to that. You know what you're, what you're saying. I, I'm speechless uh, because what you're saying is so important. Uh, you know the fact that uh, we waste experience. So many experiences we have in life are wasted because we we don't allow it to to build us up and to and to help us to recognize the things that we do have. And one of the quotes that I absolutely love, and we we've uh, this we've had this quote for a long time by Charles Swindoll, who's an author. Uh, he said that attitude is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, money, circumstances, than failure and success. That what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, ability, or skill. It'll make or break a business, a home, a friendship, or an organization. We've all heard that quote before. This is this is a great quote on, on attitude, but you are so, so right. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to feel great every moment of the day because it's sometimes when we have those moments of difficult that we really grow and we, we, we gain wisdom. Right. We do. And the thing that when we think we have to have that feel great every moment, it's not authentic. Deep down, we know that that perfect, you know, I'm grateful for this, even though I'm in here, I'm grateful for this, that we need to have that balance. We need to be steadfast. That does not mean that we don't have joy is what I, I want to circle back around to this impenetrable joy because we're talking about, we need to, to name these emotions. We need to feel these emotions. And even though we're in and we have this impenetrable joy, there's, there's still sometimes there's sadness, right? We live in a life. Oh, yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean that we don't, acknowledge mm -hmm. life. Yeah, I, we just, I mean, I just approach it differently. You know, it's not, it doesn't ruin my day anymore. I don't have to ruminate over it and overthink it or come up with solutions or any of those things. I really can just go, oh, there's a hurt there. That's interesting. And I have, for me, the practice is just, oh, okay, this is coming up for me, you know, rather than me make up a story about it and tell everybody about it. Why don't I just go inside for a minute and just go, yeah, that doesn't feel that great. Um, I can think about all the things that are going well, but let me just sit in this for a moment and just feel it like really experience it and, and like look at it and get to know it so well that when it comes again, I'm not surprised, you know, so I think it's like we get shocked all the time. It's like, oh my God, I'm like freaking out right now. I don't know why I'm freaking <laughs> out. It's like when we become the detective of your life and all the things that are going on it, emotionally speaking, then you start to catch it earlier and earlier. So, you know, now we have this conversation. Maybe there's somebody in the audience that hears this whole thing and goes, oh yeah, all of a sudden they're in the middle of like raising their voice or flipping somebody off on the road or whatever they're doing. They go, wait a minute. Oh, I just did that. That's so interesting. And we approach it with curiosity and wonder like, oh, I wonder what's going on for me that I'm honking my horn at this perfect stranger that, you know, maybe isn't in a hurry right now and, and, and made better choices or whatever, you know? And, um, and we start to look at this life very like, like I said, creating this space in between what's happening and how you're feeling. And so when you can create that space, then it's like, oh, this is like a movie out here and I get to just enjoy it. And when I see other people firing off their emotions, I can go, wow, that's so interesting. I wonder what's going on for them, you know, versus this like, let me get involved. And so I started doing this with couples lately because I think it's so powerful if you can hold space for each other and support each other in having your hurts 
and sitting in them and working on them and being okay with them versus what I think most people and couples do is like, I'm you, something just happened. I'm hurting. Let me, you know, and then I'm triggering their hurts and they're, you know, <laughs> escalating and then I'm escalating and then they're escalating. It's like, no, I can just from a responsible place, just go, Oh, that thing you just said, really, I'm it's, I'm hurting because of it. There's nothing that you need to do because I'm the one that can make me feel better. You're not responsible for making me feel better. I am then they don't have to fire off their stuff either. And then when they do fire off their things, you can go, wow, I can see that you're hurting right now. I'm not going to engage that way anymore because that doesn't feel good for me or us. I'm going to support you in this. What could I, you know, what could we talk about that might make you help you reconcile this amongst yourself? And so that's a very different approach. And I think it's exponential. If you get two people recognizing, oh, I just said something that hurt you, but it's not my uh, responsibility to make you feel better if it's triggering you. I mean, it's okay to have compassion for them and, and you know, not try to intentionally hurt other people, but know that you, I'm not responsible for your feelings and you're not responsible for mine. And so when we can come from that place, then we can really heal and grow together. And that's exponential. That is, I'm thinking about how many times we've gone through life where we get triggered with that same event, same feeling, because we don't go inside and really look at it. And I just the thought of, you know what? not having to feel that again or to be triggered like that again, or if I start to feel that way, I can, oh, I recognize that. You're not surprised. And why mm -hmm. are we surprised when we've had that experience, you know, how many times already? And I love this idea of becoming the detective of our life. Instead of the Keystone Cops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and approaching life with curios curiosity and wonder. It, it changes everything. It really and, does. Yeah. and it's kind of exciting and it takes that fear away for, for me of instead of, Oh, what am I going to find? It's like, Oh, this is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'll, it's crazy because when you start doing the work on yourself, you start seeing it in other people too. <laughs> so then it becomes like a game. It's like, Oh, that person is angry at me. I'm not quite sure why <laughs> I don't need to react. And that's interesting. I wonder what's going on for them, you know? And then you can be so compassionate, you know, knowing that sometimes you get triggered and you behave kind of wacky, you know, and you're just like, wow, how all of a sudden I'm like, my voice is raised. I don't know what just happened, you know? And then you can just go, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why I'm raising my voice at this moment because it's kind of inappropriate, you know? Sometimes we miss the signs, don't we? We do. You know, when we're talking back and forth. This is, I'm excited. I'm excited to, <laughs> to go about being my own detective of my life here and, and seeing what happens. You know, I feel like I've, I've, I've had so much growth in the, in the past few years, but I can see there's another layer here and mm -hmm. a layer of, of having this joy because there's a difference between joy and happiness. Yes, and, there is. and you know, what for you, what, how would you describe the difference between that joy and happiness? Well, happiness is based on external things. So mm -hmm. that's, you get the new car, you're happy for, and it's fleeting, right? Because at some point it's not going to be a new car anymore. It's just going to be a car, right? Even if it's your dream car that you always want, it's still going to be a car. <laughs> and, um, and that's it. So it has these qualities of outside of yourself and short lived joy however is this it's it's the exuberance it's the jumping up and down and the excitement and all that but it has all these other qualities like calm and peace of mind and peace of mind to me is the lack of the overthinking right because that's how we get into these kind of jams over all these emotional experiences is this overthinking things right we're in our thoughts we're lost in our thoughts all the time and then it has things like stillness, which is like, it just has this like a sort of ineffable quality to it. It's like, how do I explain stillness when it's just, it's quiet and peaceful and all the yummy feelings all in one, you know, where 
Yeah. I don't need to be stimulated by a, another being or another something or reading or any kind of information coming at me or to me. I get to just be in this moment right here and have no thoughts and just be at peace. And so it's all of these things. And that comes from this cultivating that joy, the internal peace that is all it encompasses all of those things. And that's a very different way to go through life than being in reaction to all the things. I've never thought of that before. I, it's, it's so true. It is true. And I look forward to having impenetrable. I need to learn how to say that <laughs> word. Impenetrable joy. <laughs> I have joy that comes and goes, but yeah. not like this. And as I practice, as I look inside, as I'm aware of these things, I know I can have it too. And really, when you talk about that, it's like, those are all the things I want. Yeah. That's I what think I want everybody most. wants that. I don't think that we talk or it, I, it's starting to be talked about more, but I don't think it's talked about enough because I don't think that people realize that they can actually have a calm mind. They don't have to be thinking thoughts all the time. I mean, we, I would just think about like, you know, of course, nobody's going to work, but you know, how many times did you show up a place that you've gone to a billion times and you're just like, wow, I don't even remember driving here. You know, all yeah. the things yep. that we do in such a habitual state of mind and we're lost in thought, lost in thought, lost in thought. I don't do that anymore. Like not only am I present in my moment a lot of the time, but I'm also not overthinking things. Like sometimes people will go, what do you think? I'm like, absolutely nothing. I've got nothing going on in my mind. And that was not something that I was aware of. And so sometimes in my classes, I'll do like an exercise where I'll say, okay, we're going to just see how much our thoughts are like going on in our mind. Cause most people don't even realize they're constantly thinking about things. I say, I'm going to ring a gong right now. And I want you to hear it from the beginning all the way till you can't hear it again. And then wait until I ring the next gong. And then you can, and hear that all the way to the end and then open your eyes and come back into the room. And I swear I only do like one or two minutes in between. And most people are like, you know, they've already gone to like, wait, did she do the gong already? I didn't hear the gong. You know, their <laughs> mind like, let's see, wait, should I open my eyes? Wait, I, I'm not sure if I heard it or not. Um, is everybody else closed eyes? You know, <laughs> it's like we get all crazy in our mind. And it's like just in a matter of a couple of minutes, like we don't even know how to just like be calm in that moment. And it's so interesting because people just go, oh my gosh, yeah, I went to like, a hundred different things went through my mind, you know? And so just the like practice of calming our mind and stilling and not having thoughts um, maybe sounds scary for people, but it is so beautiful. Ooh. It's so wonderful, the experience. So, so one of the old uh, schools of thought was to find balance in mm -hmm. your life. And uh, now you hear more of... Uh, there is no such thing as balance. It's being present at the moment, whatever that moment is, whether you're at work or whether you're at home, be present. And, and I think that there's so much wisdom in that because, you know, and Annette knows that I'm probably one of the most scattered brain people that she knows. <laughs> and uh, she'll ask me a question. And uh, five minutes asked later, I'll, I'll ask her a question. So we just talked about that five minutes ago. <laughs> and, and it's because I, I, I and, and again, we, here we go again, talking about rationalization. We rationalize. Well, this what I had to think about was so much more important than the question that you asked me, and and we get ourselves in trouble with that. Well, and I think most of the time when we're in conversation with people, we're like trying to come up with what we're going to say mm. when they've, and so often I'll ask people to just practice this real deep listening, you know, because we think we know the people that are in our lives, but actually. I think you'd be surprised if you really stopped talking and just started listening, what those people are saying. One of the first exercises I do in my class or even with working with people is I say, um, you have to be quiet and I want you to tell me when we get back together, what are the people in your life really interested in? Like, what are they really talking about? Not just the, you know, 
we do this kind of habitual talking like, hi, honey, how are you? Oh, great. How are you? You know, and, and we don't even listen to all <laughs> the things, right? If you started to like ask a question and really waited and listened for the answer, because we get nervous, right? Because it's like, oh my gosh, if there's any silence, there might be, that would be awkward, you know, especially if it's people we don't quite know as well, or even if we're used to just bantering back and forth, it's like, you ask a question, how are you doing? And they say, fine. And then you say nothing. They're kind of going like, wait a minute, wait. And actually what happens is people start to talk more and they tell you more. We hadn't given them the opportunity to do that, but they begin to do that when we don't say anything right away. They go, wait, there's a little bit of silence. This is not conscious, right? This is subconscious. This is all of a sudden there's a little more space. Hmm. Maybe I can insert, oh, this thing happened to me today. And then they start talking about that. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And you don't say anything more. And then they do <laughs> their thing. And it feels awkward at first. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. But it's so interesting what you find out about the people in your life. They actually have things to say that we haven't even picked up on because we're thinking about our things, you know? And I, you're exactly right. You know, how often do you think? You're just thinking ahead. Okay, so how can I respond to that? And not paying attention, not just with what their words are, but the, the feeling, the energy mm -hmm. back and forth. And if you're not present, you miss it all. Yeah. And how about just looking in their eyes when they're talking? Like sometimes I just look at my significant other and I'll, he'll just, he'll be, I'll ask him a question and he'll be talking. I'm just looking at him. He's like, after a while, he's like, what? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Nothing. I'm just listening. Oh, okay. And then he goes on with this thing and, and he's like, what? And I'm like, Nothing. I'm just listening. <laughs> oh, okay. And you know what he does is he starts to relax. And the people in your life start to relax because all of a sudden they're being heard by you and they can see that you're interested in what's going on for them. And it just creates this very yummy experience where people are just like, oh, I know that I can say what I need to say to this person. And what's crazy is because I practice this all the time, perfect strangers do this to me all the time. <laughs> And I just go, that is so interesting. This person felt so comfortable. They could tell me all these wonderful things about themselves. Right, right. We've learned so many gems here, really, you know, nuggets oh, and, and, and rocks to build our Karens with how we can create this life of joy and the life we want. We don't have to be stuck and, and just say, oh, this is how life is going to be forevermore. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to feel this way forevermore. And there's nothing I can do about it. We have learned some incredible tools that if we're willing to go inside, if we're willing to do the work, if we're willing to practice, you, you said something um, about being steadfast. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to be steadfast, as we make this decision that we're going to change, we're going to do things differently. We're not going to just keep reacting and doing things the same old way. We can all create this life of joy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're, I mean, it, it, I'll just say the steadfast piece is just, you know, the wonder and curiosity. If you can just get into that space often enough, you'll start to see it's small. The needle is moving ever so uh, just slightly. <laughs> and it's okay to look back and go all of a sudden you're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, you know, while I did just raise my voice in that moment, I recognize it now. So the next time, you know, maybe I recognize it like just as it starts. And the next time maybe I recognize it just before it's about to start, you know, start to see, oh, when I feel like I'm backed into a corner, that's when I raise my voice or that's when I act all crazy or do weird things, you know? And we start to see that and just go, oh, okay. And then if we could just lay off ourselves just enough, right? Just be kind and compassionate to ourselves just enough to recognize we are growing. And in that growth, we are going to have some setbacks in terms of like, 
I see it again. Oh no, I did it again. Oh, oh gosh, it's never going to get it right. No, you will. You'll get it right. Just be compassionate with yourself and others and you will begin to see the needle move just ever so slightly and ever so slightly and ever so slightly. And then all of a sudden you will find your place or find yourself in this place where that becomes your norm, where all of a sudden you're just like, oh, I don't raise my voice anymore when that thing happens. That's so amazing. And I think one of the things that we didn't talk about that I think is really important is we we did talk about that we have these go-to experiences, right? Anxiety, overwhelm, stress. We have these go-tos. And I just want to tell you not to be a doom and gloom. Those things are not going to go away by finding other ways to get them to go away. The only way they go away is through this healing. And so we have to go in and find that healing. I think we go, oh, I'm really stressed out because of this job. I'm going to get a new job. And I'm here to tell you that the next job is going to have that stress too, because guess who's there? Still you, <laughs> still doing all the things, you know, that create that experience. And so I just want to say, not to be, you know, a downer, just that the healing and growth happens inside. So I'm not saying that you're, you know, whatever, if your boss is not or whatever the environment or whatever, and you're, say your job is not wonderful, first try to heal you in that situation. And then when you recognize, oh, it might just be the environment, then you can move on because otherwise you're just going to move from that job to another job or that relationship to another relationship or that whatever to that next thing hoping that it's not going to be that but we only know how to create the same thing so just as a little sidebar that's just a, something to look out for if you do that internal work then you know then you can look at the outside and go oh, okay yeah this doesn't suit me anymore i i really like those things that you've said i've heard that analogy with moving from one city to another or one neighborhood to another and they didn't like their neighbors and they go to another place and, you know, they see someone on the street corner and ask what this city's like. And, well, what was your last city like? And they tell them, well, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. you have to do that. But, Aaron, you, you know, when I talk about trail angels, we talk about trail angels. And I just want to thank you for being a trail angel for our audience, for oh me gosh. personally. And, mm -hmm. um, I look forward to reading more things about in your book and looking and learning more from you. This is a beginning um, of the things that you've taught me, but in your personal life, just in closing here, have there been trail angels in your life? And if so, what's something that sticks out that really made a difference for you in, in making this change that you can be who you are now? I would say I did mention the one book. There were two books that really, really changed um, how I see this world and, um, and, cre and helped me to realize what was possible. You know, I think we don't, sometimes we don't have the role models in the ways that we always wanted, maybe growing up or um, even in, you know, both personal and our uh, business lives. Um, but these two gentlemen and their books really helped me to see like what's possible in this world. And I'll tell you, um, so I told you Eckhart Tolle, uh, A New Earth. The other one is um, Gary Zukov's uh, The Seed of the Soul. Mm -hmm. Those two books helped me discover some very fundamental foundational pieces for me that helped me recognize the beauty in this world on such a deep level. Their books are so profound that I've read them so many times over. And you know what happens? Each time I read them, I have a different experience. And that's how deep, you know, these are books that could reach the masses at wherever you are in your spiritual journey. And so, and that's what it's done for me. So every time I read the books and they're go-to, I will read excerpts all the time. And that's the other thing is please, please, please immerse yourself in things that speak to your soul, speak to you on a very deep level, on a very 
regular basis. It is challenging in this world when we don't have these pieces that make us feel good. I, you know, this is what I do all day long with clients, but I start my mornings in these, with these types of people, you know, either uh, audiobooks or reading so that I can really, really get into the heart of what matters to me so that I can help others and be in service that way. And I encourage everybody to do that because it's, it's very challenging to be in this world with all this resistance and, you know, maybe not thinking these ways, other people in your life, not thinking these ways. And so those two gentlemen really, really, um, just open doors for me, like in such a huge and continue to do so. Wow. Thank you. You're, you're true. You're a true trail angel. Uh, Mm -hmm. and we appreciate uh, you and you know, this, this hour has gone quickly. As, uh-huh. as we've uh, had a chance to to listen and to uh, and to pick up pieces of wisdom. So first of all, thank you so much for being a guest on on uh, Trail Angels. We appreciate you, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, that wisdom. And we look forward to to uh, reviewing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can see myself listening to this podcast probably over and over again, probably picking something else up each time I listen. And so, well, we I've got a new book to add. We, I do have the Eckhart Tolle one, but uh, the Seed of the Soul. Oh my gosh, that That's book just... is profound. Yeah, you know a book is profound when you pick it up, and you, I, I literally like still to this day, I, I go, I do not remember ever reading that, and I've read these books at least five times Mm. wow, cover to cover. And I just go like, how did I miss that before? Because we can only take in where we're at. And so that's why these kinds of books are so important. Um, But I want to thank you for having me on here and for having a platform like this. It is so important to have these conversations. It gives people hope that there's a different way that they can be in this world. And without them, then, you know, people like me don't get to share all this stuff on, on a bigger level. And that's so important. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here and speak my joy. Thank you, Aaron. Listeners, we appreciate you being with us today as well. And we hope that uh, you've enjoyed our conversation with uh, Aaron McCullough. We will add her uh, contact information uh, on this podcast as well. You know, we, we've discussed a lot of things, but uh, if we were to call it anything in that, I, I think we have to call it Im- impressionable joy. Uh, that's impenetrable joy. You know, she's got me going now. You know, we're we're going to have to learn how to say that word. But, but we appreciate that. You know, we, Sorry. Brene, Brene Brown uh, reminds us that owning our story is the bravest thing that we'll ever do. The stories and experiences that our guests share inspire us as well as to help us to grow and connect with others. We invite you to become a part of Karen the Load community through social media, as well as to share the site with those you know. We are stronger together. Keep Karen.